So listen, Billy Graham said a coach will impact more people in one year than the average person will in an entire lifetime. So I'm going to take his quote and I'm going to add a good coach will positively impact more people in one year than the average person will in a lifetime. I'm your host, Coach P, and I'm excited about highlighting the unsung heroes, the good coaches that dedicate their time, their energy, and sometimes even their money to pouring into young people day after day, month after month, year after year. Here at the Coaches Co-op, we are highlighting coaches. That's what we're here to do. So today, I'm happy to highlight one of my favorite people. Everybody give it up for the head girls track and cross country coach at <laughs> West Fork, Miss Ayana Weeks. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. All right, so Coach Weeks, I'm, I'm gonna give them a little bit of background information about you, and then I'm, I'm gonna let you jump in and, and tell us a little bit more about yourself if you'd like to. All right, so Coach Weeks is a graduate of McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana, where she was a track and field athlete. She's got a Bachelor of Arts in History and Social Studies. She's got a Master's from Arkansas State University, and she is currently enrolled as she works on her principal certification. She's going to be one of your bosses. So if you're listening <laughs> or watching to this, I'm telling you right now, she's, she's going to be your AD one day, maybe even your superintendent <laughs> one day. All right. Day. So Coach Weeks, tell us a little bit about yourself. If you'd like to, is there anything that I missed? Is there anything that you want to add to that? Awesome. No, uh, that was a great, that was a great highlight. Yeah. Like you said, um, I'm a head tracking head cross country coach. Um, this is my sixth year, um, as a coach and my fourth year as a head coach. So, uh, working my way up and I can't seem to stay out of school. It seems like every other year I get, I enroll in some kind of class or certification or whatever the case is. So we're starting on that this summer. Um, and I'm excited for that. So, but no, I think that was good. You touched everything. Awesome. Awesome. So let's, let's talk a little bit of, we're just jumping, we're diving right in and let, let's talk a little bit of, let's talk coaching and then let's, let's talk track and field. You okay with that? Absolutely. Okay. So you ran at McNeese mm -hmm. and I, I mean, of course I know um, that you were a sprinter, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, so, so Go ahead. My bad. <laughs> I was just going to no, say specifically uh, 200 and under. So 200, 100, 100 when I was um, outdoors and then indoors, um, 260 and a relay, you know, sprinkle those in, in there. <laughs> okay. So, so what's your PR? What's your outdoor PR? My outdoor PR in the 100 was 12.0. So never quite okay. broke 12 seconds. And that was kind of a, uh, for me in my career, um, actually ended up being a much more successful 200 runner. Um, and that was like 25 mid. I can't ex actually remember the exact number, but much better than I ended up being a 100 runner, uh, which was to my surprise when I got to college. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So when, when did you start running? Like, when did you know that, all right, listen, track, track and field, that's my thing. <laughs> we, okay. So I grew up in Beaumont. <laughs> I grew up in Beaumont, Texas. Um, and I'm, I, I know it might not look like it, but I'm still a part of the generation that went outside. I promise. We went outside and played. We were on the streets till dark. Like we were in the grass, in the pools and, and whatever. Right. So we were outdoors. Um, and so just honestly, just like racing the neighborhood kids, racing kids. And I mean, eventually you run out of girls to race. You got to race the boys. <laughs> so just racing the boys, elementary school on the playground. I didn't actually run organized track though until middle school. Like when you would actually like put on a uniform and, you know, mm -hmm. get spikes and all of that. But just, I mean, I've always, yeah, I've always had the athletic background, I guess, going into it, but didn't actually join organized sports until middle school. Okay. Okay. So grew up in Beaumont ran track in high school in San Antonio, right? Correct. Yes. A lot of moves, okay. a lot of moves growing up, but finished school in San Antonio. Okay. So when did you know you wanted to coach? Uh, <laughs> probably my junior year of high school. Um, if not, maybe my senior year, but just going into ending high school and realizing a, that I still wanted to run track past high school. That was, that was a big realization too, because I wasn't sure I was always on the fence about it. And I, that, at the end of my junior year, I decided, okay, this is what I want to do, but then it becomes how am I, how are we going to go about it? Right. Um, and the path to that was getting an education, getting in coaching, 
had a great coach that inspired me to do that. So I would say around my senior year, I decided, okay, I wanted to, I want to be a high school educator, educator, excuse me, and I want to be a high school coach. Okay. So did you know you wanted to teach as well? Or was yeah. it kind of like, I oh, want no. to coach, but I got to teach too. So I no. guess I'll do that. No, I, I wanted to teach. We come, I come from a, a family of teachers, honestly. My mom used to joke when I was growing up, oh, if you go to college to be a teacher, we're not paying for your education. Well, okay, mom, got a scholarship, so you don't have to. Now I'm going to be a teacher, right? That was the joke. It was always long line of teachers. It was always like, you know, go go do something else. But this is this is where my heart was. And even though I had a coach inspire me to be a coach, like I knew a, that you have to teach to be a coach in Texas. We know that's a law. Right. Um, and then B I, I knew that I would impact more people to being an educator and a coach. So I never had a problem doing both deciding what to teach was a problem at first, but I always knew I wanted to do both and have loved both of them. Okay. Okay. So your parents wanted you to do something else, but obviously <laughs> your heart was in teaching and coaching. So, so tell us what, you know, what, what's your why? Why does Coach Weeks do what Coach Weeks does? My why. So when I was, I want to say I was in high school, um, Obama was running for his second term. Okay. And so I got to vote. That was the first election I voted in 2012. Um, okay. And I heard a Michelle Obama quote sometime during that period. And this isn't verbatim, but something along the lines of when you walk through the door of opportunity, you don't close it behind you, you leave it open, you reach back and pull others through. Right. So that, that was the switch for me. And I wanted to live by that. And essentially every day I try to live by that. Right. When whatever I'm blessed with, we're going to pass it along to. So that was the start of like what career I was going to enter. Um, it took a while, like I said, to figure out what to teach, <laughs> but always, I don't know. I always had that, that passion was there too. When I actually got into education and coaching, you realize the lack of females that are in education and coaching. And we're not just talking about the coaches or the bosses or whomever. I'm talking about the participants, the athletes, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's only 38% of girls in athletics versus it's in the mid seventies for boys. Okay. So we, when we know that kids oftentimes don't, come to school or achieve in school just for academics. They want to do other things, right? They want to be involved. You want to be, you know, you want to be welcomed into something and embrace something and be successful in things. And so keeping girls in sports, keeping girls in athletics in general is a huge passion of mine. Um, and that's why I'm seeking the administrator certificate too, so that I can work in admin an administrator level and keep that in a float at an administrator level. So what, your your opinion, your best guess. Mm -hmm. Why is there such a disparity? Why is it sixty one percent of boys and then thirty eight percent of girls? Um, that's a good question. I want to say the support around it, right? Um, we know that obviously with the passing of Title IX 51 years ago, probably about to be 52 years ago, that that was something that funding to get people involved, to offer scholarships to girls and things of that nature, um, to keep them, get them athletics and keep them in athletics. Um, I would say that support and funding is probably the two, the two biggest reasons that people leave whatever they leave, right? They may not feel supported. They may not feel like purposeful in it, but we know that um, being involved in high school sports isn't just about winning. It's 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 life skills interwoven with your athletics, right? Um, so right. I think I would say those two reasons. So I'm I'm looking at this. Um, women compromise just 18 percent of qualified coaches. So right. and and then women compromise <laughs> just nine percent, less than 10 percent mm -hmm. of senior coaches. So mm -hmm. what what's the hurdle? What are the hurdles there and how can, because uh, of course we know each other, but I'm a man mm -hmm. who works in women's sports mm -hmm. and I'm always looking for women's coaches. And, and I we know that, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. So what, what are the hurdles? And then how can we remove those hurdles? I'm not even going to say help, you right. know, women who want to coach jump over hurdles. How can we remove those hurdles? What are they and how do we just, you know, let's get the hurdle crew and let's get these hurdles off the track. <laughs> what, what do we need I to think do? The, to clear up the hurdles, I think hurdle crew, A, I think a lot of it is not feeling, I want to go back to support also on the women's side. Maybe they don't see the same success as some of their male peers, male colleagues um, that are coaches, and maybe we see a lack of support. And then traditionally, education is a woman's 
field, right? There's typically more women in education than there are men. And I think a lot of those female teachers may see more success in the classroom too, and be more encouraged to move and like leave athletics and then take maybe an admin route or whatever the case is, right? And which causes you to not be a coach anymore, at least in schools in Texas. Um, So I think that's a big part of it. But we also know that the, the world is changing and you know, from the type of fans and whatever the case is, like coaches aren't always maybe cherished and honored like they may should be. And I see where that could run people off also, you know, not feeling like they're supported, not just from school, but anywhere outside of it too. Yeah. So, um, so for women who, you know, maybe want, you know, want, want families, right? Right. So I, I, you know, I want a family. Is that, is that a hurdle? A hundred percent. Like when we talk about, when we talk about um, the wage gap, let's take it out of sports, right? When we talk about mm-hmm. the wage gap and women make 83 cents every man's dollar, that's not saying we're doing, me and this person, A, are doing the exact same job and he's making this much more than I am, even though we're doing the same thing. What that means is women typically, like you said, are the, the family started, they're starting families. They're having the same home with kids. They're missing significant time off of work. And when men don't have to do that, right, they have more of a chance to advance. It's not to say that, again, we're doing the same job, same equal op- like options or whatever. Um, it's just the opportunities that, and the, the typical roles that we have in society that interfere with career. One of the re- one of the answers I wanted to say almost was empowering our women more, and I feel like I should have said that now that we're saying that because that's part of it. Mm-hmm. When you, yeah, when you t- just, you know, it's not for everybody. It depends on who you are, of course, but just steering away from that typically, and if you, yeah, diving into coaching. So, uh, as we're just kind of along the 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 same wavelength. So mm-hmm. when we talk about coach life balance, right? right. Um, what what are the, some of the in hardest and easiest things about the job that nobody really knows? So and then you know being a being a a, a woman coach, right? right? I, I'm sure right. there may be some. Well, I'm not. I don't want to say I'm sure, but I'm guessing <laughs> sure. there there may be some other things that we mm-hmm. don't know about. So what are the hardest and easiest things about the job that nobody really knows? Um, some of the hardest things I would say is obviously the time you spend away from your family. Um, I don't have kids of my own, so that's not maybe a personal struggle in that sense of having to step away from my job to be a mother. But um, on the, on the flip side, I'm still somebody's daughter. I'm still somebody's sister. I'm still somebody's friend. Right. And you have to sacrifice those things for your job. And While that's the case with every job, I don't think people realize like we're sacrificing holidays and people think, oh, well, teachers get the summers off. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I haven't I haven't met one yet. <laughs> I haven't met one yet. So it's it's things of that nature, right? When we're talking about people think, oh, it's it's just an X amount of month job and you know, you get holidays, weekends and summers off. Yes, we're not at like we may not physically be at the school or we may not be working the same hours that we're normally working, but that doesn't mean we're still not like putting our all into our job, right? The, um depending on the time of year, of course. Um Track season always tends, it's always around, it's around mom's birthday, it's around Mother's Day, um, Easter, you know, some, some pretty major things for me. So, so that, you know, spring break. spring break. Oh, yeah. Tell me. Yeah. Talk about it. So just having to sacrifice those things. And, you know, it might be you'll get to see them at a different time, of course, and spend time with them differently. It's just not it's different than what it was growing up, of course. Um, And if we're talking specifically about girls, I think one of just the and, you know, I think you you it's not it's not unrealistic to say that there ends up being drama and things of that nature that are involved in girls. And it's a different drama than boys. I'll say that not to say that there isn't drama in boys sports or however you want to call it, but it's just different. Yeah. Um, and those are things you have to deal with, too. And those are things I've had to learn. They teach me so much. It's insane. I, they probably teach me more than I teach them, honestly, and just how to deal with people and navigate that. So, yeah. Yeah. So let let's. So let's talk about track season, you know, of course it, so for those who don't know, so track is really like, it's, it's really a year round sport, Mm -hmm. right? It is. And by UIL, yeah, by UIL UIL definition, sorry to interrupt you. It can be a year long sport. We don't have a start and end date, (laughs) so we can go year round. Exactly. Yeah. So 
what um so we're getting ready for tracks track season mm-hmm. um what month is it we're, we're looking you know we're, the track schedule is made we're trying to run mother's day weekend which mm-hmm. is the state track meet weekend here in texas mm-hmm. so when are we getting started what does that look like is there an outline how do you figure out you know how to get points here and how to right. get points there like there's a science to it absolutely i'm gonna be honest with you i don't really know <laughs> so can can you break that down for me i i can try i will definitely say i haven't perfected it um and I guess if anyone has, we'd all we'd all be at state <laughs> next weekend, right? But right. Um, definitely, I guess the, the biggest thing is longevity, right? And it may not seem like it, but it's a long season. It's a grind. And just like we spoke on earlier, it can be considered a year-round sport, especially when you think about what is the training for track and field? We are running and we are lifting. Like, you know, it's very, mm-hmm. you know, it's pretty much black and white. So it for me, for what I've done, pretty much – at or around Thanksgiving break is when we're like, okay, start getting spikes, start bringing spikes to school. We're hitting the ground running. We're starting to teach those little things. Shortly before, probably like during the month of December, um, we're working on our block starts and teaching block starts because, you know, a lot of them may come in not knowing how to do block. Like that's part of it. You got to teach. Um, so let me ask mm-hmm. this question. Do kids come out of blocks in middle school? I think it depends on the middle school and the district okay. you're in. Because I've worked in a district where it was required middle schoolers like hey, y'all are using blocks too. Doesn't what mean about they're... summer track? So if young kids are I running summer track, are they I coming out of blocks? I think that's optional too. I think that's optional also. Okay. I think it's okay. optional. Yeah. I think it. I think they usually like let it depend on the kid. So it it usually ends up being something I have to teach though, because even if they do know it, it may it may or may not be most effective for them to use. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. By Christmas break. That's the hard part about high school athletics. There's only X amount of time. We can't require them to be up here all day on Christmas Day, things like that, you know? So honestly, through Christmas break, it's a maintained phase for me. It's maintaining, and we're picking it back up when we come back in January. Um, Usually first meet is mid-February, right? Um, With still training all the way through there and start tailoring off um, towards spring break area so that we're peaking right at district. So that's um, the rough outline I've used. It looked a little bit different this year because we only had freshmen at the school because it was a brand new school and there were no varsity teams. Um, so it looked a little bit different, but that's typically what I do the last four years I've been a head coach. Okay. So you've been a head coach four years. Yeah. Um, this was your first year at your new school. Correct. And how many, and you only had freshmen, right? Only freshmen, only freshmen. And what did your freshmen do at the district? <laughs> Those freshmen competed against sophomores, juniors, and seniors and won the district meet. A meet that were not, A, not in their district, B, not in their UIL classification, their class ahead of us, won the sub varsity district meet by 110 points. So that is the absolute highlight of our season. I just I couldn't be more proud as their coach, truly. And truly. how many, how many freshmen? <laughs> All freshmen. <laughs> Literally every one of them. Every yeah. single one how, of them. How many kids did you have? I probably had about 20 to 22 kids. Okay. Yeah. Pretty decent size. Yeah. Decent size. So brand new school opens, win a district championship with just freshmen. Um, so before you were at this school, you were at Spring High School, correct? Correct. Correct. And you were the head coach there for three years? Correct. Did first one being COVID year. year. <laughs> the first one was COVID year. So no, I didn't win district our first year. Our season obviously got cut short after spring break. Um, okay. In 21 and 22, I did win district that spring, the varsity district. All right. So, you know, she's going to be real humble about it, but I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that's in case you weren't paying attention, that's back to back to back. That's a three peat. So <laughs> all she does is win y'all. All she oh, does no. is win. So, yeah, that's the goal. That's the goal. <laughs> all she does is win. So, I mean, the it, it's out there. The the proof the proof is out there. The proof is in the pudding. Hey, all we're right, all let's hustling. Keep we're all working hard. Let's do it. <laughs> so, what what does a hard day look like versus a light day in track? What what does that look like? 
Okay, so if you ask a short sprinter, a hard <laughs> a hard day is going to be anything over 200 meters multiple times, right? So when we're tra- <laughs> when we're training intensive tempo, um, whether that's a 200 or a 400 sprinter, those are typically longer distances and greater reps at faster times, right? You still have ample enough break, but they they're meant to deplete your system. They are meant to deplete you so that you your body knows how to react and bounce back to when you're actually in a race, right? And you don't, you know, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. lose it after 300 meters, right? So that could be anything like repeat 200s, that could be 300s and mix of 200s. It can be a lot of things, Um, but we don't run over, I will say we won't run over 500 meters for a 400 meter sprinter. Like that's where I'll cap them at is that 500 meters. So that would be a harder day for most, uh, most people would consider that a hard day. An easier day, um, besides our recovery day, like when we're talking, um, we would do, it would probably be a speed day when we're doing acceleration. So that might be handoffs, that'd be block starts. Um, we're going over wickets, like we're, we're running fast. The only way to get faster is to run fast. You have to sprint. So those typically look like the easier days, um, for the sprinters. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, track season is a long season. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, actually, there is no track season. There's just track years. <laughs> track years. You know, there's technically no season. So do do you ever lose sleep during the season? Is there you anything know, that causes you to lose sleep? Yes. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, but I'm, it's, it's over good things, too. Honestly, I'm one of those people that if we have a great performance, if we, you know, I'm not even, not even just winning. Like I, that's great. I I love it. I'm happy for him, but we got to look at the individuals, right? So let's say I have a lot of PRs mm-hmm. or, you know, we run season best or anything like that. I'm buzzing. I'm buzzing all night. Like I have a hard time, you know, once we clear the locker rooms out and leave the field house and get home trying to wind down, like those are usually some late nights, regardless of what time we finish. So those are usually the things I lose sleep on. Don't get me wrong. There are some maybe not so positive things you lose sleep on. On, but it, it's part of it and I'm, I'm thankful for it because I know it means I care and I'm yeah. obviously thankful yeah. to be in the position I'm in. So I've, I've always said like, I, you know, my big thing is I'm trying to do right by them. So I feel like me losing sleep on it. If the problem gets resolved, it gets resolved. I, tr- I try not to do to bring work home too, too much. Um, but, you know, sometimes you can't help it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let, let me ask you this. Best high school runner that you've ever seen. Let me let me say athlete. Best high school athlete that you've ever seen and or coached. Okay. This is hard. So I'm I'm just gonna keep it to coaching because honestly, these the the kids are these kids are just so talented today. There's it's actually insane. Like, I don't know if you saw it just happened over the weekend. Th- this is nuts. A girl, she was not highly recruited. Are you familiar with Port Natchez? Port Natchez Girls, PNG? PNG. I, I'm PNG. Not, not real familiar, but okay. I, I am I do know PNG. They're a five A school towards Beaumont, right? They had a girl come out. She was not highly recruited out of high school. She ran for Northwestern State and she's now the US leading under 2400 runner. So it's just like when I tell you, like the girl, the kids are just so talented these days. I'm actually in all of it for real. So I'm gonna go yes. with this. I'm gonna tell you the best ones I've coached, like that I've seen and gotten to work with personally. Not taking any credit because they just came to me so naturally gifted, truly. But um, for boy, <laughs> truly for boys, um, DK for sure. That'll be Dorian, um, mm-hmm. who is actually a football player at the University of Houston right now. But when I tell you. It, it just, you just needed somebody to supervise him. If you could record it and then show it to him, I mean, he can, he can figure it out. Like he knows exactly like what he needs to, you know, tweak, whatever the case is. I remember mm-hmm. doing handoffs with them um, when they were on a relay, like his junior and senior year. And it's just like, you don't even have to spend that much time with them because they just pick it up so quickly. Also yeah. being a natural athlete too, being around the track culture too, you know, is very helpful, but it's pretty, it's pretty amazing how quickly um, those really talented um, athletes will pick up, pick up on things. Um, for girls, the most talented girl I've coached is probably Raya. Raya is a junior at spring right now. And I got to coach her, her so- uh, freshman and sophomore year at spring. Um, she was mm-hmm. on a four by one. She was a short hurdler for us. 
And again, just, just superwoman. She can do it all. She can long jump. She can triple jump. She can hurdle long, short. She can high jump four by one, four by all of it. She's going to state this weekend. She's going to state in the hurdles this weekend as a junior. So um, awesome. definitely awesome. the, yeah, for, for sure. Definitely some of the two um, most talented and athletic athletes I've gotten to work with. Okay. Okay. So let me ask you this, which one is tougher coaching track or running track? Running, running, running. for sure. For sure. For sure. Because the thing is, I'm saying tougher. Maybe if you ask, like, if you change it to more mentally taxing, then I might change my answer. But definitely okay. just all in all, because when you're talking about actually being a competitor and you and I know what this takes. So like not ever, some people have to learn this. And I was one of that had to learn it. But knowing what I know now. Yeah, I'm talking sleep, nutrition, recovery. The things that we want to think of are just the extras and they matter so, so much. It's the little stuff, truly. So I definitely say running is harder, but okay. I don't know. Yeah, I'm curious to know other no. coaches answers to that, too. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely uh, getting some other track and field coaches on here to because yeah. I, I, I want that feedback because I considered... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I considered running track in high school. Okay. And then, you know, I, I saw one of the guys coming off the track one day with booty lock. And I was like, no, it's real. I don't, it's real. I don't know. I was it's like, real. no, I, you I don't know, want to experience that. Ever. And it's so, and the reason it's so hard is because it's so hard to see what you're working towards. You know what I'm saying? Because you have to train the whole first semester before you can compete. It's so unique of a sport like that, you know? And so it's just, it's that mindset is so much different as an athlete, truly. So how do you, as a coach, get to see, I mean, get the kids to see where you're going? How do you get the kids to to buy in and, and trust the process? That was the hardest thing about this year. I will tell you that was the hardest thing about being a head coach this year because we only had freshmen. I didn't have anyone that I could say, not, not say, but you know, any, anything I could defer to, like they don't, I'm not, they don't know about the previous district championships or what I've done or who I, they don't care either. They don't care. They're right. like, we're here to run track. Right. And so truly it took several months for that to happen, for that to buy in. Um, track is also unique in the sense of I only had a handful of girls at the beginning of the year because a lot of other girls were in other sports. They're playing volleyball, they're playing yeah. basketball, they're in tennis, whatever the case is. So a lot of them, it, it took, it honestly took me getting that full team and being able to build up the culture there. And once they saw from one meet, just not even one meet, one, a practice in January to a practice in March, the difference, Mm -hmm. their times mm -hmm. being different that I mean that was the process right there when you can physically see the, the best thing about track is you can see it. the numbers don't lie when I can see a tangible number getting some lower and lower and lower okay we're on the right path right so it took a while it took a while but being that we had the success we did I think this class is there for sure okay so which way does track lean? Does track lean more to an individual sport or does track lean towards a team sport? I'm glad you asked me that. I love that question because in, in reality, in all reality, if we're looking at the professionals on TV, if we're watching Shakari Richardson or whoever run, right, it's mm -hmm. going to be, oh, that's an individual sport. Like it's her training, right? But in high school, are we more concerned about the results or the development of the athlete? Right. So if we're concerned about the development of the athlete, it has to be a team sport. It ha You have to build that culture. You have to have that cohesion. Like there's no other way around it. So truly one of the more difficult parts of my job as a head coach is making that understanding that this is a team sport. And when you choose not to, you know, go a hundred percent or miss practice or whatever the case is, it's not just you you're affecting. Right. So we have to make it a team sport um, in high school for sure. Okay. That, that mm -hmm. is, that's a, that's a great answer. So, <laughs> um, like do track coaches give, you know, like speeches, like a pre-race or a post-race speech? <laughs> a rah -rah to speech. Get the kids? <laughs> yeah. Does that happen in track? Or it is does. it like, listen, 
Let's y'all go. gotta go. Y'all gotta go. Right. It, th- both of those happen. Both of those things happen because the thing is, if you know your athletes, right, the same way if you know your players, like you can you can see when it's not just basketball that's the problem, or it's not just track that's the problem. It's something else. Like it's something as a team, as a program that we've got to come together collectively on. So I won't say like, oh, I planned these speeches or anything of the sort, but definitely you have to. I mean, before we get to a bigger meet, right? A district, an area or something of the sort that'll come out. But honestly, it's one of those things that it's kind of just in the moment. It's really in the moment and whatever lesson needs to be delivered at that time, it's, it's going to get delivered. Okay. Okay. So, um, if you could be anything other than a coach, what would you be? I want to ring the opening bell on wall street every day. Listen, so <laughs> I, I, I was reading job. that in your questionnaire and I was like, but <laughs> like, okay, so Does tell me work? why. I, t- no. Tell me why. Tell I'm me just why. joking. I spent a lot of time watching <laughs> um, the news <laughs> when they would have the opening bell sessions and they're just so excited. Like they're so pumped up for the day. And I just love that. I just like the energy. <laughs> no, let listen. me give you a real answer. <laughs> go ahead. No, I, go ahead. No, I thought that was a real answer. I was just, you know, just t- <laughs> tell me more. I wish, I wish. No, honestly, I think I would work for the federal government. If I wasn't in education, I would probably work for the federal government. Okay. All right. So I need to, I wish I had like the little bell. Cause right now we're headed into the bell we're lap. Here. We're headed Let's to the it. bell lap. We're here. <laughs> All right, here we go. So we're going to go four, three, two, and one. So here, here's the four. Okay. Any, any four people, if you could put any four people on a relay, who are you putting on that relay oh, and what leg are they running? Any four people. Doesn't oh matter, male or female. That's such a good question. Okay, I'll give you I'll we'll do a co ed relay. We'll do a co ed relay. Okay. Um and you know what? What what which relay is should have been my first question, actually. Which relay? Um so is my it favorite, four by one? Let, so yeah, let's let's do four by one. Let's I'm do, not let's mad do at a four by four. four. I have an answer for that one too. All right, here we go. Four well, by let, one. Let's do both of them. Let's do both of them. <laughs> we'll do both. Allison Felix okay. is going on both. I'll say that. Allison Felix has both spots. Um, Versatility. Yeah, absolutely. She can do it all. Yeah. Um, she carries on my four by one now. Um, okay. Yeah. A, yeah. Fastest time in the year. I mean, Insane. fastest time in the world right Insane, now. Insane, right? And yeah. compl- and totally win legal. So um, Usain Bolt's got to come out of retirement, of course. Uh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. You can't miss that one. Um, who's my last one? Um, oh, man. His name escapes me. He ran from Clemson. And now, is it Coleman? Christian Coleman. Christian, not Clemson, okay. Tennessee. Christian Coleman. He's on my, okay. he's my last one. So we'll go... Who, who's who's running personally? <laughs> he's scratching. She who's coming out the blocks. She carried. Okay. Um, we know Usain Bolt's running the He's got to be right? fourth. Yeah. I was All trying right. to go girl, boy, girl, boy. Hold on. So then Christian's got to be second. And then Alice has got to be third. Okay. Okay. So I might I, switch I wanted, Allison I, and Shakari. Okay. Them. So I wanted to ask this. So what's the science to a relay? Like what's the science and the art to a relay? Because I, I know... Like in the four by one, you know, somebody might have to run 110 meters. Exactly. You know, so exactly. what's, what's the science behind the, it before we get to the four by four? <laughs> it, it varies um, for me. And I, I won't lie to you. Education and coaching is a profession of sharing. So when you don't know something, somebody else does. You go ask or you go you go find it on the Internet because it, your, your problem isn't unique. Right. Somebody had a right. problem before that. So um for a four by one, personally, the two things that I know are for sure, I will always put whoever can run the fastest, the longest, that second leg. I usually like to put a hurdler there. I like my hurdlers there because they have that stamina, right? And for okay. my fourth leg is my competitor. It may not necessarily be my fastest athlete. It may not be, but who's going to fight? Like who's going to have that dog come out at the end of the race when we need it, right? First and second can kind of vary. It truly depends on the athletes and their um like their strengths, I guess. Um, if they're a better 200 runner, they might be first leg. Um, if they tend to gas out pretty quickly on a one, like me <laughs> when I was in school, um, you might go to third leg because it'll be a little bit shorter for you. So it just okay. depends on okay. the runner. Yeah. Okay. Two and four for sure. Okay. But that, that anchor leg got to have that dog. Got to. That's got a, to. That's what I love about <laughs> athletics, man. Absolutely. A- athletics, if you got... 
if you got a dog, oh my yep. goodness. Yep. Four by four. Uh, four, four by, by four. four. All right. So Allison Felix, like we said, Allison Felix is staying on there. Uh, Michael Cherry's going on the four by four. Um, okay. um, Sydney McLaughlin's definitely going on the four by four. Mm-hmm. And I actually might make her mm-hmm. my anchor because, yeah, she, yeah. Okay. Um, now I'm missing another boy. I might need help. I might need a lifeline. I'm Can missing a male. The gold shoes in the 96 Olympics? Uh, we throwing them on there? I mean, you know, like, if, <laughs> yeah, I mean, how can we not put Michael Johnson on this relay? We'll take it. We'll take it. All right. That's my fourth. So, but, um, that order would definitely go Allison first, Michael Cherry second, probably Sydney third, and then Michael fourth. Man, that's, there we go. That's a hell of a relay. There we go. All right. All right. So <laughs> here's the next thing we need. Okay. We need white flags at all the exchange zones. So it's three exchange zones in the four by Love one. It. Is that right? Love it. That's correct. All right. So we need all white flags. So here we go. Exchange zone three. Give us three things that all coaches need. Three, three things, things that all coaches need. Definitely support. Right. It's um, okay. it's obviously long nights, early mornings. It's weekends. It's holidays. It's missing birthdays. It's missing events, whatever the case is, you're not, you, I'm not going to say you're not doing this without a, a good base, but it is very hard. And I think this, um, success, the more successful ones have a good support system around them. So fill up your support system. And it may not even be the people that you see, think you may have to associate with. Like it may not be certain people in your family or certain colleagues that you have, but you're going to feel, you need to fill your inner circle with good people. Um, mm-hmm. so definitely mm-hmm. support as the first one. Um, the second one, I said a controlled ego because I don't think you, you, yeah, you, you gotta need have to, some ego, right? you gotta have something, right? You have to have that some kind of confidence, but it cannot, you can't be obnoxious. You can't be closed minded. You can't be completely unwilling to listen to somebody. You know, it may be somebody that's never ran track and field before in their life. And if they tell me something that might ring a bell to me, I'm not going to be like, oh, well, this person never blah, blah, blah. Like it might be a good idea. So I'm just saying you have to have at least that open mindedness to listen to people. Um, last one, something to keep you grounded. So I said this kind of vaguely, but I'm more so met like maybe your religion, your faith, your spirituality, whatever the case is, um, just something for lack of better words to keep you Zen, something to keep you still you. So those are my yeah. three. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right, two. And you may have alluded to these earlier. Two of the toughest things about being a track coach or just two of the things, two of the toughest things you've experienced as a coach in general. One, um, I would, I'll give you one of each for that one. So one of the hardest things about being a track coach, it actually, it's the best. It's one of the best and hardest things, if I'm being completely honest, is sharing athletes. We love multi-sport athletes. I will always be in support of multi-sport athletes, 100%. Um, Mm -hmm. We're talking injury Mm -hmm. prevention, uh, just a well-rounded person working on general athleticism, especially going from another sport to track and working on those skills. Like that's always, always, always a good thing. Sometimes it just, you know, it gets really hard when people are like, oh, it's just my second sport. You know, you know the type. So it gets a little frustrating when it's like that as a coach. And that's something I'm still trying to navigate, I would say, as a head coach. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is maybe like the athlete's full commitment when this isn't their first sport. And that's something I have to learn too, as a head coach, like how do I get someone who is just out here to get faster to buy in and understand that we need you and you can contribute, you know what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. I would definitely say that is one of the harder things about being a track coach. Um, and then what was the other one? That's good. Just, just something, uh, as a coach in general, one of the toughest oh, things yeah. you've experienced as a coach in general. I would say another tough thing is probably, I guess, any accusation that I may not be so fully supportive of my athletes or my kids or, you know, somebody, you know, and you're going to get it. It is what it is. And it it hurts right. to hear because of like we do pour all that we do into it. And it's, it, it's a tough pill to it's something hard to listen to definitely when you're being critiqued and saying that it's not even about your coaching, just that, Oh, you don't care about my kid. And it's like, that's the very first thing I care about. Like that's actually like the wild thing for me to hear. So yeah, I would say those are two of the hardest things. Yeah. That is definitely tough to be accused of something. It's almost like 
like how like you're attacking my integrity right like, like my purpose like, like while i'm here like right like i am here <laughs> for your kid like exactly. this is this is why i'm here so i would never do that all right so this last thing this is something that we do on my other podcast the network with michael prejean Sh- mm-hmm. shameless plug all right so i want you to give us one piece of unsolicited advice nobody asked I'm not sure but understand. you're gonna tell us a series series <laughs> Look, listening to this is going off no, nobody going. asked for this unsolicited advice but you're going to give it to us anything it, and you're going to give it to us anyway so what is yes. this one thing it can be I, anything i would say don't don't forget to be the student like never stop learning it doesn't matter how long you've been in the game it doesn't matter how short you've been in the game there's always stuff to learn there's always a better like there's always a way you can get better and whether that's personally, professionally, whatever the case is, I am specifically talking about coaching, but do things like be active in a way like so you can learn, whether that is listening to the network with Michael Prejean or reading a book or whatever, the, whatever, the, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever it helps you, you know, you gotta, you, you can't stop growing. Coach Weeks, that is excellent. <laughs> and that, and that is why... <laughs> She is going to be an athletic director one day or a superintendent one day (laughs) because all she does is win, but she's so humble and gracious and she is a student of the profession. Coach Weeks, thank you so much. I had such a good time. (laughs) No, this was excellent. There are so many gems dropped in this episode. Listen. I'm Coach P, signing off for Coach Weeks. This is the Coaches Co-op Podcast. And I'm just going to tell you this. Coaches do what most people can't. We are not average.